What's up everyone, and welcome to a re-upload. That's kind of a weird intro. So if you've subbed to my channel and seen this before, you may be wondering why I'm uploading part 1 of this scenario again. Well, it's because of YouTube being YouTube. I had some music copyrighted in that video, which was kind of my fault, and at first YouTube just demonetized it, but for some reason now the audio is gone entirely for a brief portion of the video. So to fix that issue, I'm going to re-upload this part, and I'll include the retcon that fixed the issue with part 1 as well, if you guys remember that. Forgive me if the audio and my voiceover are terrible here, this is one of my first videos on the channel when I was still in that awkward beginning phase. But I included some new plot points in the video and you'll be able to tell which stuff that is that was newly recorded. Otherwise, the rest of the video is going to remain the same with editing and everything. This is just a re-upload and it's not supposed to be anything special. So without further ado, enjoy this re-uploaded and partially improved part 1. And yeah, I'm listening to the audio of this video too, and I was sick during the recording of it, so that just goes to show the quality of it. So excuse me if my voice sounded weird, like, what was this, back in April? I don't know, whatever. I just hope it doesn't get striked down by the copyright filters this time. On Namek, as we know from the iconic scene, Frieza killed Krillin, which sent Goku into a blind rage and allowed him to become the legendary Super Saiyan. Well, legendary with a lowercase l, I mean, it, it's a big difference. The big l, that little l, anyways. However, this time we're going to look at what would happen if Gohan was killed by Frieza instead of Krillin. Like in the original story, everything on Namek remains the same for most of the arc. Goku uses the spirit bomb against Frieza and everyone celebrates because everyone thinks it works. To their shock, Frieza climbs out of the crater that the spirit bomb made and he shoots a beam through Piccolo's chest, gravely injuring him. Things start to change over here. Gohan gets visibly angry by this because Piccolo is one of his friends after all, and he's visibly upset by this, and he starts shouting at Frieza, diverting Frieza's attention towards him. My, my, it appears one of the monkeys is getting a bit rowdy. Yeah, I hope you like my Frieza impression, another one to add to the list. Instead of Krillin, Frieza starts to lift Gohan up into the air. Due to Gohan's power and little bit of a rage boost that he has right now, he's able to resist it for a bit, but this would only prolong the whole thing because Goku and Krillin can't really do anything right now as they just watch in horror. Frieza closes his hand and Gohan explodes in the air, killing him instantly. Krillin is in absolute disbelief and he's horrified by what he just saw, but Goku's feeling a little bit different. Goku is immensely angry, even more so than he was in the original. Of course Krillin was his best friend and seeing him die sent him into a rage, but seeing his son, who's an innocent kid, being killed by Frieza, that just pushed him even farther. This is worse than seeing his best friend die. Goku's hair starts to glow as he violently twitches, and in a shorter time span than the original, Goku is able to turn into a Super Saiyan. Albeit due to his rage, he transforms in a more violent manner. Also due to his rage, he gets a little bit of a boost in power, which we'll get into a little bit later. Goku glares at Krillin and tells him to get Bulma and leave, and Krillin obliges right away. Seeing his friend look like that scared him more than anything. He looked animalistic rather than the Goku he knew. So Krillin grabs Piccolo and goes off to find Bulma like Gohan did, and they go to leave Namek. Since we have power levels at this point, we can still see the difference in power, and we can look at it through numbers. At this point in the story, Goku had a power of 150 million in his Super Saiyan form, while Frieza was at 120 million at 100% power. He was weaker than Goku in the original, so he didn't stand a chance even then, but this time Goku's power level is around 180 million, a 20% increase because of his height and rage. Goku also decides not to show Frieza any mercy this time, also due to the rage. After Frieza deals the finishing blow to Namek, this only causes Goku to be angered even more. So here's where I want to stop myself. In the original video, I never included this, and I ended up having to retcon and include it in a separate video, but I'm going to splice it in here so things make sense. Originally, I said that Frieza killed Gohan. However, we're going to change it a bit and say that he gravely injured Gohan instead, similar to what he did to Piccolo. Gohan was able to resist Frieza's attack better than Krillin, and instead of being completely blown up by it, he barely survives it. Frieza struggles with trying to kill the kid, and instead he just launches a powerful blast that sends him flying off in the opposite direction. Krillin evacuates the area with Piccolo, as he tries to find Gohan since he can still sense Gohan's energy, even though it's very faint. While Goku continues fighting with Frieza, the wishes are made to revive everyone killed by him and to bring everyone currently on Namek to Earth. And since Gohan's still alive, he's brought back to Earth, but he's pretty much still dying. By the time he does arrive to Earth, it's too late. There's no way to help him in time or get Senzu Beans, and this is how Gohan actually ends up dying. 
The reason I'm including this is because in the original upload, I said Gohan died right away, but if he died right away, then the wish to revive everyone on Namek would have just brought him back as well, and that would make this what if pretty pointless since not much would change from the original story. The retcon was kind of sloppy, but so was the whole writing for this original part since it was one of my earlier videos, so I apologize. With that out of the way, let's get back to the original video itself. Blinded by rage at the loss of his son, and of the eventual loss of Namek, and all the pointless lives that Frieza took, Goku quickly beats Frieza down and decides to kill him, with ease this time. Frieza is completely vaporized, and he's actually dead this time, so we don't have Mecha Frieza, which we'll get to a little bit later. Since he finished the battle quicker too, although not by much, Goku's able to find the ship and escapes into space before the planet explodes, instead of it being at the last second, so it's pretty clear that he survives this. The ship flies off to Yardra as Namek explodes. On Earth, everyone of course is concerned. Gohan is dead, and everyone assumes Goku is as well, and this is especially bad for Krillin because like when Goku died against Raditz, he's the one who has to break the news to Chi Chi, and that's probably the worst part of all this for him. As we know though, Goku is on Yardra, but Gohan is in a different place. Alongside Tien, Yamcha, and Chaozu, Gohan's in pretty good company because he just made it past Snake Way all the way to King Kai's planet, and he's preparing to train there. So of course, like the original, everyone on Earth waits a couple of months for the Dragon Balls to reactivate, because they need to wait for the Namekian year to pass. During this time, however, on King Kai's planet, there's a little bit more strenuous training going on. See, Gohan, after seeing Goku's power with Kaioken, he kind of wanted to learn that himself, and that encouraged the other humans on the planet to learn that. So during this time period, Gohan, Tien, Yamcha, and Chaozu all train to learn the Kaioken with King Kai. All the while, while Goku's on Yardra doing his thing learning instant transmission, which happens like normal. So, a Namekian year passes and the Dragon Balls are brought forth. Purunga is summoned, and like the usual, they try to wish for Goku back, only to find out he's still alive and he can't be brought back because he wants to come back on his own terms. King Kai sends a transmission to Bulma and Krillin, telling them, Gohan needs a little bit more time training with him, because he wants to see what his full potential really is. But he tells them they can revive the other humans, because they do have three wishes, and there's three of them that need to be revived. In the original, Tien didn't want to be brought back, because he felt like he needed to do some more training with King Kai. But this time, because Gohan was there, and they started learning the Kaioken, he feels like he's had enough training, so of course, Chaozu goes back with him too. And Yamcha, like in the original, he goes back. Those three are brought back to life, and we can see the fruits of their training. They all have access to Kaioken times 2, with Tien and Yamcha being on the verge of Kaioken times 3 because sadly Chaozu is pretty much weaker than both of them and he probably wouldn't be able to handle anything past that, unless he trains a little bit more. Of course they train in the meantime and another Namekian year passes. This time they're actually allowed to bring Gohan back because King Kai feels like he's finished his training with him. So Gohan is brought back to life and we can see he has Kaioken times 4, but he still needs a little bit more practice with it. You see, he has the say in physiology that the other humans don't have, so I'm sure his body would be more capable of handling the stress. And of course, every time he uses it, he will be beat down even more, and then he'll come back and get a Zenkai boost, so it keeps snowballing until he's able to use it more effectively. And while they did have another wish to bring Namek back, there's still one extra wish that's remaining. Piccolo decides that they should wish for Kami's youth, similar to what King Piccolo did in the original Dragon Ball where he regained his youth and he became a lot stronger. This would be beneficial because, well, Kami's pretty old, and wishing his youth back would make him a lot stronger and probably able to make the Dragon Balls stronger too, similar to how the Namekian Dragon Balls are, so this would only be beneficial for them. And it also becomes very important later on, and you could probably see where I'm going with this, but that's for another part. While Kami isn't present there, he does know what's going on because he can listen into what's happening. And of course, he thinks this is a great idea. It's only beneficial for everyone, especially him. I mean, he is a god after all. It would be good if he's a little bit stronger. So, they decide to wish for his youth back, and he notices right away the dramatic increase in power. All his wrinkles go away, and he starts to resemble Piccolo a little bit more, because he does have his youth back after all. He's delighted to see the dramatic increase in power, and he is now a lot more useful than he was before. And he gets to work on improving the Dragon Balls, similar to how the Namekian ones are. Now that those two wishes are settled and everyone's revived, the Namekians get their planet back. Well, their new planet. And they go off to that like in the original. And of course, Vegeta goes off to another planet like in the original with Train. If Kakarot gets to Train, he should too. He wants to be as strong as him, if not stronger. 
Especially since Goku, a low-class warrior of all people, has the Super Saiyan form, but he, the prince, doesn't. So that wouldn't change because of course Vegeta would want to pursue that form. Back in space, King Cold is kind of confused. He hasn't heard from his son in a while and he wants to know what's going on. I mean, surely he couldn't have lost to some simple monkey, no. So he flies off to where Namek is, or was, only to find that nothing's there, not even Frieza. He equips the scouter, tries to contact him, or even just to scan for his power, and he can't see anything. He assumes the worst, and he knows Frieza is dead. However, he did hear something interesting before. See, he still knows who Frieza fought. He knows it was a Saiyan known as Goku, and because of Vegeta traveling to Earth before, he knows that Goku lives on that planet. Although disappointed that his son lost to a Saiyan of all people, He's obviously still pretty angry, so he travels to Earth to enact his revenge. Time passes and everyone's still training. The humans want to boost their Kaioken, Vegeta's off on some planet training to become a Super Saiyan, Goku's on Yardrat, and Gohan, well, he's a little different. While he does have Kaioken, he knows about the Super Saiyan form too and he wants to pursue that himself. He's angered that he wasn't able to protect himself last time. He could have avoided that death if he was a little bit stronger. That's why he wanted to learn Kaioken, he didn't want to be helpless anymore. For all he knows, they could have stopped Frieza earlier on if they just killed him right away if he had some sort of power boost like Kaioken or Super Saiyan. On King Kai's planet, he worked with King Kai to try to at least tap into the form. Of course, he wasn't able to do it at this point, but he was able to do it for a little bit. His hair turned gold, but he couldn't quite hold the form. He needs some sort of catalyst to fully unlock it, kind of like Goku had or at least some more intense training, but at this point in the story, he's not going to have it yet. That's going to come a little bit later, and we'll get into that in the next part. For now, he has his Kaioken, and similar to the humans, he's trying to improve that, because he does know he could push it farther, up to 20 times at least. One day during their training, they sense a huge power level coming in. It feels similar to Frieza, but not quite like him. And they thought Frieza was dead, but no. Something else is coming. This is not Frieza. They all travel to where they sense the power level coming from, and they see a ship descending. Out walks someone that looks like Frieza, but not really. Before King Cold even does anything, something unexpected happens. All of his soldiers fall to the ground, and all he sees is a purple-haired boy standing there with a sword. Oh, and who are you? I'm a Super Saiyan, and the one who's here to kill you. It's none other than Trunks, who's arrived from the future to help save the past. But he's a little confused, though. Where's Frieza? Only King Cold is here. From what he knows, Frieza and King Cold came here with Frieza's new mecha form, but he doesn't see Frieza anywhere. He powers up to Super Saiyan, and everyone, especially Vegeta, is shocked to see that this random guy that just came here is a Super Saiyan. First Kakarot, and then this nobody? Why is everyone becoming a Super Saiyan all of a sudden? Trunks makes quick work of King Cold, and the deed is done. Goku then arrives, and this is where we're going to leave it off for now. Although this might not seem like a major change with Gohan being killed instead of Krillin, this does cause some interesting things to happen. For one, Frieza is actually dead. Goku got insanely enraged by this, and he didn't show any mercy to Frieza, and he ended up killing him instantly. Gohan ends up training with King Kai on his planet, and ends up learning Kaioken, along with the other humans, Tien, Yamcha, and Chaozu, who are on the planet with him. They all end up being revived, and of course, they're much stronger than before with Gohan having tried to tap into Super Saiyan, but he couldn't quite get there yet while with King Kai. And of course, the last part ended with Trunks arriving, because in order to avoid any timeline confusion, I'm going to keep Trunks' timeline in the same. As Dragon Ball Super showed us, time travel isn't really just going backwards in time in your own timeline, it's more like jumping to another one, but that's a whole other topic that I don't want to get into, and rather than messing with timelines, we're just going to keep Trunks' timeline the same and say he comes back to this timeline instead. However, he arrives only to find King Cold and no Frieza around, since Goku showed no mercy to Frieza this time. Also, Kami used an extra wish from the Namekian Dragon Balls in order to regain his youth, much like King Piccolo did before in Dragon Ball. Now with that quick little recap, we can continue with the arrival of the androids. Trunks' conversation with Goku goes similar to how it did in canon, with Piccolo hearing everything as it goes on. He informs Goku of his identity and who he is, as well as informing Goku about the androids, and he gave him the medicine for the heart virus like usual. 
Of course, with this news, like in the original, everyone begins training, and the three-year gap of training begins until the androids arrive. Over this time period, the humans would try to master Kaioken and take it to higher levels. Yamcha and Tian are now able to do Kaioken times 5 with ease, and are able to even push it to times 10 for brief periods of time. Chaozu, on the other hand, he's only able to do times 3, and he can barely push it to times 5, since he is still weaker than the others, but this is still a nice improvement for him. Of course, Krillin wasn't with King Kai, and, and he is feeling a little bit left behind. Super Saiyan, Kaioken, everyone's getting all these new transformations and techniques, and he's just kind of left behind with what he has already. While they can't teach it as well as King Kai, everyone of course wants everyone to be stronger, so of course, Tian and Yamcha would try to teach Krillin Kaioken, even if it wasn't as effective. I mean, even if he could power up a little bit, that's still good enough. Since they can't really teach it as well as King Kai, and since Krillin did get a bit of a late start, I feel he would be able to master Kaioken times 4, and he would try to push it a little farther, but he would need more practice. And of course, Yamcha does try to use the gravity room like in the original story, but this time he actually ends up succeeding. Albeit at a much lower level than Vegeta, and while using his Kaioken. As he starts using this room himself, the other humans would join him as well so they can all get exponentially stronger. On the other hand, we have Gohan, who has made a lot more progress. As I touched upon in the last part, being a half Saiyan, Gohan's Saiyan physiology would allow him to handle Kaioken much better, kinda like Goku does, not to mention he does have a lot of latent power due to him being a hybrid. By training with his father at higher levels of power, he's able to crank it all the way up to times 10 and master that, and Goku himself is able to further use his Super Saiyan form with ease. And while Kaioken is good, Goku does want to teach Gohan Super Saiyan, since he did briefly touch upon it while he was on King Kai's planet, but he couldn't quite get there yet. With all these numbers, it might seem a little overwhelming, but to put it in simple terms, everyone is a lot stronger. Gohan of course trains with Goku, since he wants to access his Super Saiyan power as well, so Goku helps him reach this goal of course. He notices Gohan flare up one time while they're training, just for a very brief period of time into Super Saiyan, before dropping out of it due to exhaustion. He's almost on the verge of accessing Super Saiyan, but he's not quite there yet, so he does need a lot more practice, or some sort of catalyst at least to break him into doing that, kind of like Goku had on Namek. The three years have passed, and after all this time training, the androids have finally arrived. Everyone heads down to the location they were told by Trunks, and they head into the city and split up in order to find the androids. They're having kind of a hard time finding the androids since they look just like normal humans. Suddenly, Yamcha is grabbed by someone, Android 20. His power begins to get drained, but instead of being punched through the chest, Yamcha is actually able to free himself this time since he is powered up a little bit, and he tries to put up a fight but gets beaten down by 20. Everyone rushes to his location after noticing his key took a sharp drop, and they find him trying to fight 20, with 19 close behind. Yamcha told everyone what happened, and how they must have absorbed his key somehow, since he had his hand on his face and then his power started going down by a lot. With this knowledge, Goku and everyone take the fight out of the city, and he challenges 19. This fight goes pretty similar to how it originally did. Goku's fighting 19, only to get out of breath, and he starts clenching his chest. They realize the heart virus has struck, and Goku falls to the ground, clenching his heart. Before Vegeta can even step in, Gohan is enraged by this, and he powers up to Kaioken times 10 and launches himself towards 19, but he still can't match him at this rate. Blinded by his anger, he's suddenly grabbed by 19, who wraps his arms around him, which only infuriates him more. Before 19 can even drain any energy, Gohan explodes in a flash of light, which rips 19's arms right off his body. From all this extra training and all his new strength, combined with the rage that he has now, Gohan is now a Super Saiyan, earlier in the original timeline. On the last part, a lot of people in the comments said that Gohan should access Super Saiyan earlier, and I feel like this is a good time for him to do it. Instead of doing it over the three years, this fight acts as a sort of catalyst for him to end up doing it, and he finally unlocks the power. With this new power, Gohan easily pummels 19 into the ground. Since 19 doesn't have arms anymore, this is a good opportunity for Gohan to kill him. He charges up a massive Masenko, and he kills him easily, as he falls to the ground out of breath, due to him being exhausted from Super Saiyan as well as using Kaioken before. Naturally, everyone is pretty shocked to see this, Gohan is actually a Super Saiyan now like Goku, and with this brief distraction, 20 uses this as an opportunity to escape. Before he can, however, he stopped in his tracks. Vegeta, who is now also a Super Saiyan, is in front of 20, not allowing him to leave. Like 19 did in the original, 
Android 20 tries to absorb Vegeta's energy, only for Vegeta to rip both of his arms off as well. I don't have time for your cheap tricks. Vegeta makes quick work of Android 20, and both of the androids are now dead. Trunks then arrives and finds out what happened. None of this is right. The two androids here aren't the same ones as the one in his time. Something is wrong. Like the original story, Bulma remarks that Android 20 must be Dr. Jiro, since she did see him in some magazine before, and she knows the general location of his lab. So, she does tell it to everyone. But without having Jiro to chase after, it takes everyone a bit longer to find the lab, so they end up splitting up. After a long time searching, they end up finding the lab, but they find something very horrifying. They arrive in the lab to find three pods labeled 16, 17, and 18, and the ones labeled 17 and 18 look like they've been broken into and are completely empty. They hear footsteps out of the dark corners of the lab as a large green figure nears towards them. Nice of you all to finally show up. It's Cell, and he's in his perfect form. Without Jiro there to release the androids, and with everyone distracted, this was the perfect opportunity for Cell to achieve perfection. It was really like fish in a barrel, he just walked in the lab and absorbed them quickly. Everyone is confused as to who this guy is, and they ask as Cell fills them in on who he is and what he's done with the androids. I could kill you all now, but that would be no fun. How about I give you all 10 days to trade? Everyone of course is left speechless, but Cell takes the silence as a yes. As he leaves, he tells everyone that they should keep an eye on the news tonight. Everyone then receives a message from Kami, who asks for Piccolo, Gohan, Vegeta, and Trunks to come to the lookout, since he may have a way to help them train, and that he will contact the humans later with the same info. As he heads to the lookout, the humans decide to stay back at the lab and see what they could find on Cell. Maybe there's some blueprints anywhere, or some way to exploit his weakness. They end up finding an embryo, and they realize that it's Cell, so they do end up destroying that quickly. However, Krillin remembers something interesting. There was a third android pod in there labeled 16, and the android is still inside. Krillin wonders if Bulma could do anything about him, such as reprogramming him into being a good guy, so they might have an extra person fighting on their side if they can get this to work. He's dormant right now, so he won't do anything to them if they take him out of the lab, unless they open the pod. So Krillin carries the pod out, and the lab is blown up as everyone heads back to Capsule Corp. Back on the lookout, the other four arrive as Kami informs them of the hyperbolic time chamber. He thinks it's best for these four to train first, since they have the greatest potential, and since Goku has still fallen ill to the heart virus, Trunks and Vegeta head in first. Piccolo approaches Kami at this time, and he tells Kami that they need to merge. After seeing how powerful merging with Nail made him, he wants Kami to do the same. Remember, not only is Kami younger now, but he's a lot stronger than he was before. So the results of this Namekian infusion will be very different from the original, and very beneficial for Piccolo. Reluctantly, Kami ends up agreeing, as he puts his hand on Piccolo's chest. The Namekian assimilation begins, and this is where we'll leave off for now. We left off with Vegeta and Trunks going to the time chamber to train, and Kami merging with Piccolo. In this timeline, remember, Kami is much younger than normal since there is an extra wish that wasn't claimed, allowing him to restore his youth like King Piccolo. He saw it would be better if the God of Earth was young instead of old and not very powerful. He's a lot stronger now than before, so this Namekian fusion will yield a lot better results. Piccolo and Kami merge into one being, and the results are apparent right away. Piccolo's power is insane, and is nothing like anyone has ever sensed before. The original fusion made him strong, but this one is way stronger. With this fusion, he's nearly as powerful as Super Vegeta when he makes his inevitable appearance. His power is massive because of this fusion, and it's comparable to Super Vegeta or Semi-Perfect Cell in the original story, but he has more power than either of them this time. This is great because of how strong he is, but one issue is that Cell is perfect now, so even though this fusion did give him a huge boost, he's actually kind of underwhelmed by it. But once the Saiyans are done in the time chamber, he could train himself, with this new power and become stronger than ever. Vegeta and Trunks emerge from the chamber, and they don't really have anything to do at this point since they're no match for Cell, so they don't go off to fight him. They just spend their time outside of the chamber, training in the gravity room instead. Goku wakes up, and he and Gohan head into the time chamber, and they actually see different results from the main timeline. Gohan is already a Super Saiyan, and is much more motivated to train here than he was originally. This allows them to get a head start, and they're actually easily able to go further beyond Super Saiyan up to Grade 4 and perfect the form, 
only in a few months rather than taking the whole year. Given that they've perfected this form and can use it efficiently with little stamina loss, they decide to crank up the power, literally. Both of them know that Kyle can, and since they can use Super Saiyan as easily as their base form now, they experiment a bit and try to further master Kaioken and eventually combine it into Super Saiyan to create Super Kaioken. With Kaioken alone, they can only do about 40 times with some strain, but it's kind of useless to them since Super Saiyan with Kaioken is much more powerful and efficient. Even Super Saiyan alone is more powerful than just Kaioken. When they use Super Kaioken, however, the multiplier is much lower because even though they've mastered Super Saiyan, it causes immense strain on the body using these two techniques together, so it's not like they're going to be going Super Saiyan Kaioken times 40. Remember when Goku went Super Saiyan Blue Kaioken times 10 and he could barely manage that? It's kind of like that here, where they can go times 10, but it's very risky for them, so they're sticking to very low multipliers for now. They end up having a lot more time in the time chamber to train because of how efficient their previous training was, and Goku is confident that they're more than powerful enough to defeat Cell now, so he decides to work on teaching Gohan some interesting techniques instead, rather than focusing on furthering their power because they see it as high enough already. The two exit the time chamber much more powerful than they were in canon. They're both about 1.5 times as strong as they were originally, and that's without Kaioken. With Kaioken, they pretty much feel unstoppable. Vegeta is furious and heads back to the time chamber quickly with Trunks to try and master Super Saiyan himself, much to Piccolo's anger since this means he has to wait longer. Vegeta and Trunks are actually able to master Super Saiyan and come out of the time chamber a day later, and Piccolo finally gets to head in and train, but he doesn't have a training partner. Tien actually offers to go in with him since Tien's one of the stronger humans at this point, and is the most skilled with Kaioken when compared to the other humans. Since Piccolo is so much stronger, Tien has to train with Kaioken a lot to keep up. This training allows Tien to actually master Kaioken times 10 and being able to push it up to times 20 and even times 40 for very brief periods. This is great for Piccolo because he has a strong training partner and this means he can get a lot stronger than if he were just in there alone. This also means Tien gets stronger, obviously. By the time they leave the time chamber, I would place Piccolo just under how powerful Goku was with Super Saiyan Grade 4 in canon. Not as strong, but weaker. And if Tien were able to go Kaioken times 40 and use the Tri-Beam, he'd be insanely powerful, but realistically he'd only be using times 20, so he's going to be somewhere below where Piccolo is now and above where Semi-Perfect Cell was. And remember, I'm comparing Piccolo to the Super Saiyan Grade 4 Goku in canon, not the one in this story who's way more powerful. The fact that Piccolo and Tien, some of the side characters, are more powerful in this timeline just shows that everyone here is way more powerful than normal, and combined they heavily outmatch Cell without them even knowing it. And at this time, of course, Dende is also recruited like normal as Earth's new guardian. Needless to say, they're pretty confident about fighting Cell, and as much as I'd hate to say it, it's a pretty anticlimactic fight. What happens here is, well, first Goku fights Cell and is pretty one-sided. They're even at Goku's Super Saiyan level, but if he uses any level of Kaioken, Cell just becomes fodder. He wants to let Gohan have a turn, so he ends the fight and even gives Cell a Senzu. Cell is basically a training dummy for them. Cell realizes this and gets insanely angry, and is being dominated by Super Saiyan Gohan. Gohan is about to finish him off when suddenly, Cell inflates and prepares to explode. Oh no. Goku regrets toying around with him, but Gohan has an idea, and he thinks quick. And this is where their extra training in the time chamber to learn techniques comes into play. Gohan ends up showing off another technique that surprises everyone except for Goku. He grabs onto Cell and then he disappears. Whoa, 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 wait. Salad, did you say that Gohan has instant transmission? Well, yeah. Remember I said they had a lot of extra time in the time chamber and Goku taught him techniques? Well, this was one that he taught Gohan. Why would he teach him this and how? Well, after what happened on Namek, Goku wanted to teach this to Gohan if he was ever in a deadly situation like when he was with Frieza, so that he can escape. No one has ever asked Goku to teach them this technique before, but Gohan actually asked him to teach it this time. And considering they're already strong enough due to their training, Goku decided to teach Gohan how to use this. And while Goku was on Yard Art for a year, we don't know how long it actually took him to learn it, and even if it took months on end, they still had more than enough time in the time chamber to practice this at least half a year. So yeah, Gohan actually knows this technique now. He teleports Cell to King Kai, and quickly apologizes as he grabs King Kai, Bubbles, and Gregory, and teleports back to Earth. King Kai is mad about the loss of his planet, but he calms down realizing that it's better than Cell killing everyone on Earth. And even though he doesn't know it, 
He has it a lot better this time, considering he doesn't die. But we all know how this goes. A beam then hits Trunks to the chest, killing him instantly, with Super Perfect Cell using his own instant transmission to come back to Earth. Vegeta is furious and attacks Cell, with Cell just knocking him to the side in anger. Cell is confident with his new power, but is enraged that Goku and Gohan didn't take him seriously, and charges towards Gohan. Super Saiyan isn't enough anymore. Gohan powers up to Kaioken and keeps raising his power even higher. Cell is raising his power too, and he sees Gohan using Kaioken, and then realizes something as Gohan increases his power. Alright, you want to use the Kaioken? Well, why don't we even the playing field? He attempts to activate Kaioken, and it works. He knows every technique Goku does and was able to pick up instant transmission, and I mean if he's able to do that then I'm sure he could do Kaioken. And now things start looking bad. Cell is actually getting an advantage over Gohan. His Kaioken alongside with his super perfect form create a deadly power that allows him to begin to overwhelm Gohan. Much to everyone's surprise, he's actually able to knock Gohan down, and this prompts Goku to jump in alongside with Piccolo and Tien. Gohan was their strongest fighter, and this trio is temporarily able to hold Cell off with Goku using Super Kaioken as well, and Tien using his own Kaioken. Cell just power-ups further by exploiting Zenkai's with his faster regeneration, and is able to knock down Tien and Piccolo, leaving only Goku who is wearing out. Cell is getting cockier and enjoying himself, and begins to brutally beat down Goku like he wanted, not even noticing that Kaioken is actually kind of draining him. This beatdown is reminiscent of Goku's fight with Piccolo Jr., just because of how brutal it is when he's beating Goku down. But out of nowhere, a loud scream is heard as Gohan rushes in and his power soars. He joins in the fight and together, he and Goku overwhelm Cell and quickly charge up a Kamehameha together, with Cell launching his own. Cell actually tries to push his Kaioken even higher, and it's kind of a suicide move because it ends up draining his stamina insanely quickly and injuring him, but it amplifies the power of his Kamehameha greatly. They're about even, but Gohan gets even more enraged during the struggle as they begin to lose. And suddenly, his power skyrockets as he lets out another roar as his hair spikes up and sparks begin to appear around him. For a very brief moment, Gohan unknowingly goes Super Saiyan 2, on top of Kaioken, with Goku looking over in surprise. This allows the father-son Kamehameha to incinerate Cell pretty easily, and for good, with the duo dropping back into base, obviously exhausted from this. Goku looks over to Gohan in a state of shock. Gohan! That power! What was it? Gohan, of course, has no answer. The defeat of Cell is celebrated, and the arc ends a lot like normal, except Goku is alive this time, and King Kai, Bubbles, and Gregory are temporarily on Earth, with King Kai being introduced to Dende actually because they're all part of the Realm of Gods, and Dende is kinda a new co-worker with him in a way. And the androids are revived like normal, with 16 still being alive, even though he wasn't present in the fight against Cell and getting killed. Huge change here with the androids. They actually encountered our heroes because they were absorbed by Cell right away. And that means Krillin never meets 18, and he doesn't remove the bombs from them with the extra wish. Instead, the extra wish is used by King Kai to bring his planet back, so everything's kind of back to normal for him. But one question here remains. What was that power Gohan showed off briefly? It was way higher than Super Saiyan, and the power boost wasn't due to Kaioken since Gohan somehow already stacked that power on it. Goku and Gohan now have this new goal to achieve, which is to pursue whatever power Gohan just displayed that's beyond Super Saiyan. For all they know, if he didn't teach Gohan instant transmission, he could have accessed this new power in the time chamber instead. Now that the Cell arc is over, we get into the time skip. The androids are still alive this time, but Krillin and 18 never actually had their interaction, so that doesn't really go anywhere, and 17 is pretty unimportant to this part as well. However, 16 never died in the last part, so he sticks around with not really much to do. For now, he's mainly just a bodyguard or capsule corp, since he's a robot and he doesn't have any true purpose anymore, sadly, since he no longer wants to kill Goku thanks to some programming. Goku is obviously still alive, and he spends a lot of time training with Gohan to unlock that power he showed off, as well as with Vegeta. The Saiyans actually train a lot together, with Gohan being very motivated to train this time around. In this scenario, an important change in Gohan occurred when Frieza killed him. He no longer wanted to be a defenseless kid. If he was stronger and not afraid to fight, maybe he wouldn't have died against Frieza. And he actually accomplished this by saving Earth from Cell's explosion, as well as helping killing Cell when he regenerated after it. He of course still attends school, but he's very motivated to train nonetheless. Similar to what happened in my what if about Goku going to Vampa after Namek, Gohan actually becomes the great Saiyan earlier on, which in turn means he meets Videl earlier too. 
With all of his training and his desire to help people, as well as the fact that he wants to be able to get to school without people finding out he has the powers that he has, he takes up the disguise of the Great Sandman so no one suspects that it's him. Except Videl, of course. Besides that, Gohan's training is going pretty well. He, Goku, and Vegeta have all actually accessed Super Saiyan 2 during the time skip, with Gohan still being the strongest of the group. And since a lot of you suggested it, Vegeta actually learns to use the Kaioken during this time of training. While Goku and Gohan did get Super Saiyan 2, they want to add to it by putting Kaioken on top of it just like they did with Super Saiyan. Vegeta didn't want to be left behind, of course. He demanded that Kakarot would teach him this technique, and he got what he wanted. Now you might think people just suggested it because it sounds cool, or that I'm putting it here because of that, but when you think about it, it makes sense. So many of the characters in this scenario know how to use the Kaioken, so why would Vegeta willingly be left out, especially when it increases his power so greatly? And of course during this time period, Goten is still born. Now with all of that out of the way, we can get into the Buu Saga. The World Tournament is coming around, and most of the same people join, except 18 obviously isn't present for it in this scenario. Instead, Goku actually seeks out Tien to see if he wants to join, as well as Yamcha. Given the old times where Goku would be at tournaments with these two, he wants to try to go back to that again, since it sounds like fun. So in 18's place, we actually have Tien and Yamcha, with one of them instead taking the place of one of those unimportant side characters that was part of the tournament. This is a nice reunion to see, and even though Chiaotzu is only spectating this one since he feels like he's too weak to face the people he knows, we have a lot of the original tournament members from Dragon Ball. Goku, Krillin, Tien, Yamcha, and Piccolo. The tournament itself is pretty routine. We get the same setup for it all, and we end up reaching the part where Videl fights Spobovich, and we have that brutal scene of her fighting him, followed up with the usual events of Shin and Kibito coming into the story. Gohan goes up against Kibito, and this time, he shows off much more power to him. Gohan at Super Saiyan 2 is actually more powerful than he was originally, despite unlocking it later. Even though it did take him longer to unlock it, he got way more training in the 7 years than he did originally, as well as being able to use Kaioken on top of it. So he cranks it up to Super Saiyan 2 and then Kaioken times 10 on top of that to show Kibito his true power. Of course, he can't maintain this for long. So it's really just for show. This is when Spopovich and Yamu strike, and Kibito makes the grave mistake of letting it happen. Spopovich and Yamu fly off with the group chasing after like normal, with Tien and Yamcha joining in this time to help them. At Bobbity's ship, he's happy to see that the two got the power for Boo's revival, and then he proceeds to kill them. Deborah ends up killing Kibito like normal, and he ends up turning Piccolo and Krill into stone. But this was a big mistake for him, since the Saiyans, even individually, far outclass Deborah, and Gohan actually fights him outside of the spaceship and wins with little effort. Shin tells him that defeating Deborah will result in Piccolo and Krillin coming back, and since they don't have time to mess around any longer, Gohan actually kills Deborah, which allows Piccolo and Krillin to return to normal. Now normally Gohan wouldn't really be up to killing people, but I feel like this would be something he would do just because of the fact that it saves Piccolo and Krillin, and he knows Deborah is a huge threat so there's not really anything else they could do. He learned his lesson with Cell, he can't be afraid to do stuff like that. This whole scenario is focused around him having a change of heart after Frieza killed him. So he's not exactly like the Gohan that we know. He knows when killing must be done, even if it's something that he doesn't really want to do. Except for the now dead Kibito, everyone heads into the spaceship. Bobbidi is shocked to sense Deborah's death, but he doesn't care too much this time. Kibito didn't realize it, but Gohan's energy this time around was more than enough to revive Boo. Not only was he stronger in Super Saiyan 2, but he had Kaioken as well, giving the two Majin servants much more energy than they got originally. In the actual story, Gohan's energy was about half of what Baba needed to revive Boo, so this time around it would certainly be more. Not just because of the training, but the fact that he had Kaioken on top of Super Saiyan 2, so of course he's going to put out a lot more energy. There's no need for fights on the side of the ship, and there's no need for Baba to possess Vegeta. Baba probably wouldn't even be able to possess Vegeta in this scenario since Goku's still been alive for the past 7 years, and Vegeta wouldn't really have the desire to change because Goku's been around. It doesn't really matter either way. He's happy that he has the power he needs now. The group arrives on the ship, but it's way too late. They see Bobbity teleport out with the egg, and he smirks towards everyone, thanking them for their contribution and power. While Kibito and Shin's plan allowed the group to track them the ship, it also allowed Bobbity to awaken Boo. The egg begins to crack as Boo emerges from it to the surprise of everyone. Things have taken a turn for the worst, and the only thing the group can do now is fight. First, some of the Z fighters go to kill Bobbity, since it's the easiest thing they could do right now. The Saiyans hold off Boo and allow for this, so the group has at least taken care of Bobbity. Shin warns them that they can't defeat him, but they at least want to attempt it. Goku, Gohan, and Vegeta go Super Saiyan 2 together and attack Boo, 
which is actually able to injure him a bit, but he keeps regenerating as they run out of stamina. Boo is getting angrier and angrier. These guys are starting to really annoy him. And on top of that, Vegeta is slinging insults at him left and right, and that just makes Boo more enraged since he kinda has a short temper anyways. Eventually, the Saiyans all use Kaioken on top of Super Saiyan 2, and collectively fire a blast at Boo which seemingly disintegrates him. The group is relieved, that wasn't really that hard. But then Shin notices that there's still pieces of him around, and he begins to heal. The group ends up falling back for a bit, as they watch Boo reconstruct himself, and then he begins steaming. All of the frustration and anger from this fight is beginning to get to him, along with the fact that they're trying to kill him, and he suddenly ends up splitting into Good Boo and Evil Boo right in front of the group. Great, now there's two of them? Vegeta shouts as he tries to attack, but Goku and Shin hold him back. The two Boos begin to fight each other with Evil Boo clearly having the advantage. Since no one really knows what to do, the Z Fighters and Shin just watch, because maybe the Boos can just kill each other. But then they see as Evil Boo begins to absorb Good Boo, and he creates Super Boo. No one is sure what just happened, but then Boo turns to them and charges. He spreads his arm open to absorb the group, and a few of them dodge in time, but Boo is too fast for some of the others and gets them. Goku, Gohan, Vegeta, and Shin all make it out of the way. But, Boo closes in on the humans and Piccolo. In an attempt to save some of them, Piccolo is able to fling Tien back, and Krillin pushes Yamcha out of the way. So while it saves those two, Krillin and Piccolo end up getting absorbed by Boo. With one person dead and two people absorbed, Shin yells to the group to retreat, as they quickly gather around him and he teleports away to the planet of the Kais while Boo is transforming. Boo's absorption of Krillin and Piccolo goes smoothly and it comes complete, creating a version of Super Boo that takes on Piccolo's traits like Bukolo, but has the powers of Krillin as well. Bukrillo? Buprillin? I, I don't really know what to call him here, but let's stick with Boo for now. He has all of the strategic mastery and techniques of Krillin, as well as the power and intelligence of Piccolo. He might not seem that threatening, given that it's just Krillin and Piccolo inside him, but this makes Boo here extremely smart and cunning with the two he's absorbed. What he lacks for in the power that he might have had as Boo Tanks in the original, he makes up for in intelligence, as well as his new array of techniques and strategies from Krillin. He heads off to begin destroying Earth, and of course to find some sweets for himself to eat. That group that he was just fighting just seemingly disappeared, but he doesn't want to worry about it right now. He just wants to go off and do what he wants to. Just like they originally did, Goten and Trunks actually left the tournament to go follow Goku, Vegeta, Gohan, and that whole group to see if they could help in any way. Goten and Trunks end up arriving to the scene, but they're too late. They don't see anyone around, other than a few scraps left of Kibito, the abandoned ship, and Boo's egg. Boo has now gone off on his own to spread havoc. They sense the energy of Boo and it's really strong, but they feel the energy of Krillin and Piccolo in his direction as well, but no one else. Is everyone dead? Did Goku and Gohan instant transmission somewhere with them? They're not really sure what happened, but they want to help and they want answers, and they also want to go find Boo. But then they hear a voice talking to them. It's Dende. He's been watching what happened, and he will explain to them what's going on, and he wants to help them, but he first tells them to gather the others at the tournament and help to bring them to the lookout. Since this is basically God telling them what to do, they decide to head back to the tournament and get their friends, since this seems like the safest option for now. Dende knows what's going on, and he could help them. On the planet of the Kais, the group is trying to figure out what to do right now. At first, Gohan and Goku suggest the idea of bringing the rest of their friends over here with instant transmission to be safe, but it's too risky. Given that Boo is intelligent enough now to do so, they risk Boo sensing their power when teleporting back to Earth. Boo would either be quick enough to intercept, or if they're successful, he'll try to coax everyone into coming back by causing even more havoc or even destroying the planet. For now, Shin communicates with Dende and lets him know that everyone here is safe and he waits for Dende to give him an all clear so they know when everyone's on the lookout. Cause if not everyone's at the lookout, Goku's not even going to be able to gather up everyone. Like yeah, he and Gohan might be able to find Goten, Trunks, and Videl, but as for anyone else over there, they're not really going to be able to detect their key. Right now, all they can really do is train to fight Boo. They can try and revive Kibito later, but if they leave the lookout right now to find the Dragon Balls, Everyone risks dying, but unbeknownst to them, Boo is paying close attention and is closer than they think. But he's not going to attack the lookout just yet, he's playing the long game. Shin informs everyone with him that he'll help train them, but time is of the essence so they can't spend too long doing it. He gets an idea and knowing that the current strongest of the group is Gohan, he recommends having him try and wield the Z-Sword. 
For the others, he recommends that they try and train with Kaioken to increase their power and their ability to use Kaioken. Gohan is eventually able to pull the Z-Sword out of the stone and wields it, easier than he was able to in canon, and he begins training with it. In order to speed up the training, Shin decides to see if everyone else can use the sword as well so they can take turns. Goku and Vegeta are able to actually pick it up after some struggle and transforming, while Tien and Yamcha are barely able to even hold it unless they have their Kaioken maxed out. Everyone tries training with it and making some progress, but they don't have enough time to actually make use of this training. Shin decides to have them stress test the sword and actually use it in combat to see how effective it is, by throwing Kachi Kachin at it since the sword itself may be a useful weapon for one of them to use. They think the Kachi Kachin will be good target practice, but it ends up breaking the sword in half like normal. Shin and everyone else are panicking right now. That one thing that was helping them train is now broken, and they didn't even mean to break it. Shin especially is scared now. He just broke the sacred Z-Sword. But to everyone's surprise, Elder Kai emerges from the sword after it breaks. No one, not even Shin, knows what's going on now, but they're able to figure out who he is and what just happened after talking to him. Now with him there, things begin to turn around, but there's a bit of an issue. He tells them about the ritual to unlock potential, but it will take a while to actually complete, so while it is useful, they need a lot of time for it to actually happen. Considering how long it takes, the group decides that it might be worth using that ability on Gohan, since he's the strongest right now, while the rest of them return to Earth because sitting around here isn't really doing anything. Goku and Vegeta have gotten a little stronger from their Z-Sword training, so together they might be able to hold the Boo off. And if they ever need to, Goku could easily escape. Considering that Tien and Yamcha are around as well, and they have Kaioken, one idea the group has is bringing them back to Earth and having them train in the time chamber in the meantime. While they could send Goten and Trunks in, those two are just kids and don't have the experience or discipline that Tien and Yamcha have in a fight. After having contacted Dende, Shin knows that it's safe for Goku to actually head there now to the lookout, as long as he doesn't let his energy get too high. While on Earth, Goku will bring Dende along with him back to the planet of the Kais so he and Vegeta can train themselves and have someone to heal them. By having a healer there, that means they'll be able to do much more intensive training and exploit Zenkai boosts. With this plan now in mind, they put it into action. Goku brings Tien and Yamcha to the lookout, and they begin to train in the time chamber. With some intense training, Goku and Vegeta, as well as Tien and Yamcha, now have their own methods of getting stronger in order to fight Buu while Gohan is having his potential unlocked. Everyone else remains on the lookout, since they're safe there at the moment, and after catching everyone up to speed, Goku then decides to instant transmission back to the sacred world of the Kais. Meanwhile, Boo is obviously off on his own, and he's killing time. He doesn't know when the group will return, and he could just destroy Earth now, but if he does that, there's no fun in it, because they won't come back here to fight him. He just spends his time fighting militaries, eating treats, and generally just causing chaos. He could be patient and wait for them to come back after whatever they do. I mean, he does have Piccolo in him after all. Patience is basically part of him now. In the time that he doesn't cause chaos, he could just meditate. This Boo doesn't end up forming a friendship with Mr. Satan either. He's not like Fat Boo where he'd be spending his time making a house and then befriending a dog. And Mr. Satan isn't even around there anyways. He was brought up to the lookout this time since he was at the World Tournament Arena, and I mean since Videl's with them, of course they're going to take Mr. Satan as well. Given how long Gohan's ritual is taking, and the fact that everyone wants to be as strong as possible, about two days end up passing until everyone is finally finished with whatever training they've been doing. Goku and Vegeta have been able to use Super Saiyan 2 with less stamina drain, and are now able to use Kaioken at higher levels and use it better, all while using Super Saiyan 2. Tien and Yamcha, after two years of training, are now way more powerful than before. Without any transformations, they've been focusing on Kaioken only. Their base forms are exponentially more powerful now, but now just a little weaker than where Goku and Vegeta were in their base forms before this arc started. Keep in mind, I'm talking base forms from before this arc actually began, because Goku and Vegeta are a lot stronger now in their base. With Kaioken now, they can use times 20 with no struggle at all, and are able to use times 52 pretty easily. If they needed, they can use times 100, but it causes a lot of strain. That means they're essentially able to get the same multiplier as Super Saiyan or Super Saiyan 2. At Kaioken times 100, 
I would place them above base Vegeta and Goku right now, but under their Super Saiyan forms. It may sound like a big boost, but keep in mind that they had two years of intense non-stop training and now have Kaioken times 100 because they spent time improving that. And as for Goku and Vegeta, they obviously still have Super Saiyan, Kaioken stacked on top of Super Saiyan, and then the same with Super Saiyan 2. But even when you consider that, Tien and Yamcha still got an insane boost in power. Since Gohan's ritual is taking pretty long and isn't complete yet, Gohan is left to finish the ritual while everyone else goes to attack Buu. Goku, Vegeta, Tien, and Yamcha should be more than enough to fight him now. Given that he might destroy Earth during the fight, Goku brings everyone on the lookout to the planet of the Kais for the time being, so they'll be safe. Buu's basically killed all of Earth's population already, or at least most of it. After the group returns to Earth, they go out and find Buu. Like I said before, Buu has been watching. He wasn't looking to kill anyone right now, I mean other than just random civilians, but he wanted to absorb someone from the Z Fighters. Knowing he's no match for the group now that they've trained, he devised a plan. He draws the group out to his location, where he's laid some pieces of himself around hoping to absorb a member of the group. His main target right now is Goku, the most powerful one present. The group begins their fight with Buu, and they're pretty shocked to realize how strong they are now. They're able to actually do pretty well against Buu, with Tien and Yamcha helping out too and getting a lot of hits in. Buu waits for an opportunity during the fight, and he gets one. Without anyone noticing, he slowly crept his pieces closer and found the moment to strike. Quickly, all of his pieces swarm Goku as the group jumps back. Goku can't even escape now given how many pieces are surrounding him, and he ends up getting absorbed by Buu. Now, Buu has absorbed Krillin, Piccolo, and Goku. He has now become Buku. You know, that name kind of sounded good on paper, but it doesn't really sound that well when I say it. Anyways, the group stands no chance now. And now without Goku, they can't even retreat. Luckily for them, Gohan's ritual completed during the fight, and now he's arrived to help. His new ultimate form is insanely powerful, but then he realizes what he's up against. He's able to actually hold off Buku for a bit, but starts to get overwhelmed. Buu is far too powerful, and then he completely begins to dominate Gohan once he realizes he has access to Kaioken now. Gohan has only one option, retreat. He instant transmissions to Vegeta, Tien, and Yamcha, and then teleports everyone back to Shin, who's been watching the whole thing happen. Now out of options, Elder Kai has one last suggestion that he just remembered, but it has a sacrifice with it, Patara Fusion. He explains what it is and how two people can fuse to fight Buu, although the effects are permanent so they're going to be stuck together forever. If Buu isn't stopped, the universe will be destroyed, so they at least need to try this. Tien and Yamcha could fuse, but they may not be strong enough to beat Buu. At best, their fusion, even with Kaioken, would only do as well or a little bit better as Gohan did, in that Kaioken would end up draining them especially if they run that times 100 for too long. They only have one other option of a fusion, Vegeta and Gohan. While the two know each other a little bit better in the scenario and are closer, Vegeta of course turns this down right away. There's no way he'd fuse with someone. Everyone tries to get him to, but he refuses. Boma then steps in and pleads him to do it, and this gets through to Vegeta. Besides, she also suggests that they might be able to use the Dragon Balls to defuse them. Vegeta ends up finally agreeing, as Vegeta and Gohan each receive an earring. With no better option, Gohan and Vegeta put on the earrings, with Gohan thanking Vegeta for helping out. Together, their fusion should be enough to kill Buu once and for all. The fusion begins in front of everyone, and for those who get sense power, it's amazing to watch. Even the Kais are shocked. After the light of the fusion clears, a new figure is standing there, Vegehan, the fusion of Vegeta and Gohan. Vegehan turns to everyone and gives them a smirk. He's ready to go. He places his fingers on his forehead and instant transmissions to Earth. Buu is just about to instant transmission to wherever Gohan just went, under the assumption that he's already won and there's nothing the Z Fighters can do to defeat him now. But because of that, he remained on Earth, allowing the Z Fighters to attempt whatever last resort they had. Maybe it would be fun for Buu to watch. Nothing they do would be enough to kill him. Or at least, that's what Buu thought. Right when time's almost up and just as he places his fingers on his forehead to instant transmission, he suddenly senses a power far greater than he could have ever imagined. In front of Buu, a new warrior appears, dressed in blue. Is that... Gohan? Wait, it looks like Vegeta. No. It's both. 
Before Boo can even process what just happened, a punch is delivered square to his jaw, dealing a lot of damage. Huh, even, even without transforming, transforming, our power is far above yours. Boo gets up, shocked at the power he's just witnessed. No big deal though, it was just a lucky shot, right? Boo begins to go all out, at first not dealing any hits to Vegahan, but then he actually starts landing some. However, they don't do much damage at all. If Boo is going to go all out, then Vegahan might as well give him a show. I can, I can only, only imagine, imagine how strong I'd be with the Kaioken, but, but let's, let's actually go a step further. further. Vegahan powers up, his hair turning golden and its energy rising to unprecedented heights. I, I guess, guess you, you could just call this Super Vegahan. Now in Super Saiyan, the fusion is even farther beyond Boo. Getting annoyed and knowing he's going to lose, Boo launches a candy beam at Vegahan, who is now turned into candy. It doesn't really do much though. Candy Vegahan is still able to do some damage to Boo, and ultimately, gets reverted back to his normal state. Vegahan is now being very cocky, not wanting to kill Boo just so he can mess with him a bit, but also partially because if he kills Boo, Goku, Piccolo, and Krillin will die as well. The Vegeta part of him wants to kill Boo right now, as it could just bring back everyone with the Namekian Dragon Balls. The Gohan part of him wants to save everyone inside. Instead, they decide to willingly get absorbed by Boo first, after the fight hasn't been going for too long. While inside Boo, they're able to free Goku, Piccolo, and Krillin. Then they find Fat Boo, but they don't worry about freeing him, so they leave him and they just escape as Boo starts to revert to another form. Seeing Boo transform again, Vegahan is just tired of all the new forms. Boo is wide open for a kill shot. Cupping his hands in front of him, Vegahan prepares the blast. He then lifts his hands over his head, charging it further. He throws his hands down in Boo's direction, unleashing the blast, a final Masenko. Boo stands no chance, and he's absolutely disintegrated by the blast. And just after launching this blast, Vegahan defuses. Before Boo even had the chance to revert to Super Boo, he's destroyed by the final Masenko. Watching from the planet of the Kais, everyone celebrates. Gohan is glad that they won, and Vegeta is too, but Vegeta's mostly glad that they just defused. He didn't really want to be stuck with Gohan forever. Shin brings everyone back to Earth as they all group together, and since Kibito isn't around, Dende heals everyone. Goku, Piccolo, and Krillin are now conscious again and are told about what happened, and now the goal is to reverse all of Boo's destruction. A celebration happens and everything's back to normal after messing with the Dragon Balls, and that's the end of this arc. Life goes back to normal for the next few years. Vegeta and Goku continue to intensely train, while everyone else takes a bit of a break. Tien and Yamcha continue training further after that experience they had in the Room of Spirit and Time, since they didn't want those two years of experience to go to waste, and all the strength they got from it. As for Gohan, he's a family man now, and he does occasionally train but it's nothing extreme. Between work and family, he can't fit it in that much. But he does train a bit, still having a little motivation for it. After a few years pass, they suddenly encounter their next villain, Beerus. After dreaming about some Super Saiyan God, Beerus proceeds to search for this new rival. His search brings him to Earth, where he and Whis arrive at Boma's birthday party. Beerus has a pretty good time here, enjoying the food and festivities, as does Whis. However, he still wants to find his rival. In terms of power, Goku, Vegeta, and Gohan are all fairly even. Even though Gohan got his ultimate form, Goku and Vegeta's training allowed them to catch up so everyone is pretty much on par. If anything, the strongest one right now is Vegeta who's a little bit ahead of Goku and Gohan, but only barely. His brief fight alongside the Z Fighters against Boo before fusing with Gohan, as well as the experience he got as Vegahan, puts Vegeta a little bit ahead. Only by a small amount though. The humans here are way stronger than normal, now that they know Kaioken, but they don't really do anything to Beerus. As for Goku, Vegeta, and Gohan, they can't do much either, and they're all pretty even in terms of power, so no one outperforms the other. Beerus is a little bored, and thinks that the Super Saiyan God isn't here. He's about to leave, deciding to spare the planet due to its food, but he's still a little bit disappointed. Before leaving though, Shenron is summoned and asked about the ritual, which intrigues Beerus. This pleases the Destroyer, as the mortals are going out of their way to impress him and meet his desires, and maybe they'll be able to find the Super Saiyan God as well. After learning about the ritual, it all goes pretty much like normal. The ritual doesn't work at first, but then Videl joins and it ends up working. However, Goku's not the one to get it this time. Instead, Vegeta is the one to receive it, being the strongest here. As the Super Saiyan God, Vegeta now faces Beerus, and Beerus is happy, knowing that his dream was correct and he actually found his Super Saiyan God, his newest arrival. Beerus notes that while Vegeta is strong, he still doesn't have the power yet to truly dethrone Beerus. However, with some training, 
Vegeta might be able to surpass him later on. Pleased with the fight, Beerus invites the Saiyan to come train with him sometime, and potentially get a lot stronger. Vegeta takes up Beerus on this offer, wanting to become stronger. Beerus is content with the fight they just had, and is also happy to see that Vegeta has the motivation to surpass him. This Royal Saiyan could make for a potentially interesting student for him and Whis. Vegeta returns to Earth for a bit after the fight, as the Destroyer says goodbye and thanks everyone for the great food, and thanks Vegeta for the great fight. After a few days of preparing, Whis arrives to pick up Vegeta, with only Bulma knowing about Vegeta leaving like normal. Vegeta doesn't purposely keep this info from Goku either, he just didn't have any reason to tell him, and Beerus did only ask Vegeta to train, not Goku as well. After a few months pass, Goku finds out that Vegeta is training with Beerus, meaning he's even farther ahead of Goku now. Goku isn't even a Super Saiyan God yet. After getting into contact with Whis and Beerus, they actually accept having another student. Beerus thinks it could be interesting to have two Super Saiyan Gods instead of one, and gladly lets Goku join in as well. Goku ends up going to Beerus' planet, and the two of them continue training there, with Vegeta being ahead due to the early start. They continue to train here, while on Earth, the humans and Piccolo keep doing what they're doing and getting some light training, but not that much. As for Gohan, he's still not really training that seriously, nor does he want Super Saiyan God. He's content with Ultimate right now, and wants to strive to power up more, just like in Dragon Ball Super, only as a human and not as a Saiyan. He could use Super Kaioken 2 after all his training with Super Saiyan 2 and Kaioken, but it's pretty draining, and it's actually less powerful compared to Ultimate. He's fine with falling behind Goku and Vegeta in terms of power, he's still strong in his own way and he can defend himself in Earth if need be, so he's living up to his own goals. And that's a good thing too, as Earth is about to face another threat, the Frieza forces on Earth, ready to revive their Emperor. The person who killed Gohan and started the scenario was about to return. The soldiers from the Frieza force that are sent to Earth are successful in gathering the Dragon Balls, and they summon Shenron to revive their Lord. Frieza is happy to be back, no longer having to suffer in that personal hell of his, and now he begins to do something he never thought he would do. Training. It's so primitive and disgusting, and it's something Frieza never thought that he'd ever have to do. To think I'm stooping to the level of these monkeys. Disgusting. However disgusted he may be, it's a necessary thing though. Frieza continues training for a few months, and eventually unlocks something new, his golden form. A brand new transformation for him that powers him up greatly, choosing for it to be gold so everyone knows that he's on top. This should be sufficient enough. After all this training he did, well, now it paid off. And he doesn't have to train anymore, because he's already powerful enough now, so that's a good thing. He can finally stop with this nonsense and return to Earth to get his revenge. And he does exactly that. He's also a little bit excited, ready to get some revenge on Goku and test out this new golden form in action. And when he arrives on Earth, the Z Fighters are there waiting for him, or at least what's left of the Z Fighters on Earth. And they take out the Frieza Force a lot easier than normal. Not only are all the humans here stronger, as well as Piccolo, but they also have an extra fighter, Yamcha, and Gohan is there too and he's a lot stronger than before. He doesn't even need to transform, just his base power here is enough to take out the Frieza Force fodder. Wow, that's a nice tongue twister. And with all the training the humans have done for the ones who have Kaioken, it's a lot easier now to take on these foes. No matter though, Frieza will handle the rest by himself. Frieza ends up confronting Gohan, remembering that he was the kid that he killed on Namek. He makes light of this and jokes about it, all while he's still in his first form, and thinks that it's funny to see this kid trying to face him again. But Frieza doesn't realize that Gohan's not even at his full power right now. And Gohan's not even the most powerful one here, Vegeta and Goku are still not here yet, and if they get here, Frieza will be nothing to them. Knowing how Frieza is and not wanting to let him transform and become more powerful, Gohan decides that it might be a good idea to end this right now while he has the opportunity, and he doesn't want to waste it and be stupid. Gohan quickly powers up to Ultimate, confident that he can take on first form Frieza, and right away, he charges up a powerful blast, and eliminates Frieza on the spot. Frieza doesn't even have time to react, not expecting Gohan to attack him right away. But after his last encounter with Frieza, Gohan doesn't want to risk it, so before Frieza even gets to transform into his golden form, or even his final form, he's killed by Gohan while still in his first form. That was pretty anticlimactic. Goku and Vegeta arrive on Earth to see what happened, and then they realize that Gohan took care of it. Not like it would have been a problem for them anyways. Some of you might think this isn't in character for Gohan, but you gotta remember, in this what if, he has a different mentality now when it comes to fighting. That's the whole reason he trained more in the first place in this scenario. Well, at least back in the Dragon Ball Z parts he did. After being killed by Frieza that first time, 
He didn't want to be weak anymore and wanted to defend himself from situations like this. And knowing how Frieza is after that experience, he's not going to let him get away with it a second time. So yeah, Frieza dies before he can even do anything. Following the last part, we now arrive to the Universe 6 tournament. Shampa arrives on Beerus' planet, and we get the whole thing about the tournament being set up. Pretty standard here. The team isn't too hard to make here either. Vegeta and Goku are two obvious picks, and the next two obvious choices are Gohan and Piccolo, both of whom are much stronger than their canon counterparts. Finally, we need a fifth member. Minaka isn't around here because Beerus sees no need to include him. Vegeta is already motivated enough to keep going and his goal is surpassing Beerus, while Goku is motivated to catch up to Vegeta here. Minaka isn't needed as a motivator because of these two things. So for a fifth member, they go for the next strongest option, which is Tien. Yeah, Tien's kind of an oddball pick, but in this scenario, he's made an immense amount of progress in comparison to his canon self. In the Cell Saga and Buu Saga, he had much more training and experience, training which was more rigorous as well than his normal routine. Tien also has Kaioken here, and while the Saiyans focus on their Super Saiyan forms instead of Kaioken, the humans who have learned Kaioken don't have any other transformations or techniques to actually focus on. So all of Tien's focus has really been towards improving Kaioken and increasing his stamina usage in it. They could actually ask someone like Yamcha or Krillin, or even a really oddball pick like Videl, who's actually been kinda training with Gohan a bit like I briefly mentioned earlier, even though she's still very weak in comparison. Or even Goten and Trunks are options as well. But Tien is the best choice here. He's the strongest human, as well as the strongest option in general. Plus he's a master at strategy and martial arts, unlike someone like Goten or Trunks, so he's naturally the best fit here. Tien hasn't been able to truly test his power in a while, and while he has his dojo to actually maintain, leaving it briefly for a tournament isn't something he minds too much. Tien is much more involved with the group after his experiences in the Cell and Boo saga during this scenario, and the same applies to the other humans as well. And even though the others are good choices, Tien is still the best option here. In terms of training, Goku and Vegeta still head into the Room of Spirit and Time for three years beforehand, and they get some good training in like normal. This training allows them to practice some new techniques as well as improve their power, and you'll see what I mean during the tournament. Three days pass, and they exit the Room of Spirit and Time, and after taking a shower and shaving, they end up heading to the tournament with the rest of the group. Arriving on the unnamed planet, Universe 7's fighters are now ready to fight. For the order, it goes as follows. Goku's up first, followed by Piccolo, then Tien, Gohan, and finally, Vegeta. First, we have Goku vs. Batamo, and there's nothing really that changes here too much. Goku gets the win against Batamo, and it's nothing out of the ordinary. And since Universe 6's order remains the same, next Goku ends up facing against Frost, and he loses like normal. That's a little strange. People suspect that Frost is up to something. How could he defeat Goku so easily? He doesn't even seem that strong. Next, he's up against Piccolo, and just like normal here, Piccolo gets defeated too. This guy shouldn't be that strong, where he could defeat these two so easily. Tien is up next, and having three eyes and sharp vision really helps him here, because he's able to pick up on something that no one else noticed. He's been able to pick up on Frost's movements, and he picked up on the fact that Frost has been lunging his wrist out towards Goku and Piccolo, albeit very subtly, and this catches Tien's eyes, all three of them. And that's when Tien spots it. On Frost's wrist, it's barely visible, but he can see a light reflecting off it. There's something on there that's metal and reflective. Tien points it out, and it's found that Frost is using needles. Plus, Frost's true identity is revealed. Not really surprising, considering everyone judged him to be kind of like Frieza from the start, but no matter. Tien didn't want him disqualified, though. He wants to actually test out his strength against him. And instead, he fights him just without Frost using the needles. And it's a pretty close fight, but once Tien pulls out his Kaioken, he's able to secure the victory. And it's a good practice for him and lets him see where he is in terms of power. He actually enjoyed it quite a bit. Moving on to the next round, Tien faces up against Mageta. Tien can't hurt him at all, but after finding out about his weakness, Tien is able to insult Mageta in order to win the fight. But he finds out about the weakness kinda late into the fight, long after Mageta already tried to smoke him out by heating up the arena. Tien forfeits after this, leading this match to be a draw. With Mageta making the arena so hot, he needs to catch his breath and recover his stamina. He wouldn't be good in the fights if he kept going like this. He's too tired out from the heat, and he doesn't really want to push himself too far to where he'll probably pass out or die and be useless to the team. Next, Gohan is up against Kaba. Gohan's pretty interested to hear that Kaba is actually a Saiyan, but he's also surprised to find out that he doesn't know what Super Saiyan is, and that he doesn't have a tail, or he wasn't born with one either. Gohan's actually pretty intrigued to hear about all this stuff, especially seeing this other universe, and how it even has similar races, but they're even different than the Universe 7's. You know, being a scholar and all, 
Gohan would probably love to learn about this kind of stuff and study other universes and make some big discovery, so this is really going up his alley. But even though it's interesting for him to learn about, that's obviously not what he's here for. They're both here for a fight. Unlike Vegeta, Gohan isn't going to teach Kaba about Super Saiyan in the middle of the fight or try to force it out of him. The two of them have a friendly match, both in base forms, and they form somewhat of a nice bond here. Gohan ends up winning against Kaba pretty easily, and Kaba doesn't learn Super Saiyan here. And Gohan says that he'll teach him at some time in the future, maybe if they meet up again, but this is going to have big consequences later on. You can probably infer what I'm referring to. Kaba only knows about Super Saiyan, but he doesn't actually know how to access it or if he can even use it himself. And that'll have a snowball effect later. Universe 6 has one fighter left, and it's Hit, who faces off against Gohan first. Gohan tries to fight him, but his attacks do absolutely nothing. He pushes himself all the way to ultimate, and it closes the gap a little bit, but the gap is still massive. He's still no match. He's able to figure out Hit's time skip though, which is a breakthrough for the team. But even though Gohan knows about it and how to counter it, he's not actually fast or strong enough to do that, especially when Hit's ahead and he's always improving. Gohan gets eliminated by Hit eventually, and now Vegeta is up to face him. He's not too worried though. Watching Gohan fight Hit gave Vegeta enough insight about Hit's ability. So even though the time skip ability seems kind of worrisome, he has an idea of how he could fight against it. Vegeta starts first in blue, powering up more as he fights. He's learning how to work around Hit, but Hit keeps improving. He gets a few hits in, and knows it's not enough. Eventually, Hit's time skip gets to a point where it's too long for Vegeta to handle in his current state, letting Hit use his time skip for about up to a second. Luckily for Vegeta, this isn't his limit. Although he hasn't tried this technique in a while, he and Goku were working on something potentially useful in the room of spirit and time. Vegeta begins powering up as Hit watches. His ki grows immensely, and then suddenly, he calms down. Vegeta shouts Kaioken, and he activates the technique, the crimson aura mixing with the blue flames of Super Saiyan Blue. The arena is filled with a blinding light and a deafening scream from Vegeta as he ascends beyond Super Saiyan Blue. Goku's not too surprised. He would've used this as well if he had the chance, because he has access to it too. But what he does know for sure, Vegeta is ahead of him at the moment, setting a higher ceiling for Goku to break. In case you need a little bit of a refresher, Vegeta did learn Kaioken in one of the previous parts, and even trained with it for quite a bit. With Goku learning Blue Kaioken, of course Vegeta's gonna learn it as well. Vegeta's key soars even further. Hit is amazed. It's twice as strong. Triple. Quadruple. It keeps growing and it seems like it's not gonna stop. With one last push, Vegeta finishes his power up. Times 10! Cool, I got to do a crappy impression for this video. Anyways, Vegeta's now in Kaioken times 10 and launches towards Hit. Vegeta's power is too immense and Hit can't even do anything to counter it. Vegeta greets Hit with a flurry of punches and kicks, eventually charging up a final flash while Hit is temporarily stunned in the air. Not wanting to waste time, Vegeta charges the attack quickly, launching a full power final flash that sends Hit flying out of the ring and nearly outside of the dome they're in as it pummels the glass and almost breaks it. Powering down, Vegeta sees the results of his power-up, with him having won against Hit. Hit is outside of the ring, and he stands up, injured, but he's amazed at the power of Vegeta. Vegeta wants to fight Hit again someday. He knows that Hit's holding back and can't use his full abilities, but he'll have to save that for another time. The tournament isn't really a place for Hit to be using his assassin techniques. With this fight concluded, Universe 7 is victorious. The wish still happens, and Beerus wishes for Earth to be restored in Universe 6, just as a little gift for his brother. In the meantime, everyone goes back to their normal lives. Vegeta and Goku keep training, Piccolo and Tien also do as well, and Gohan still does but to a lesser extent and goes back to his work and family life. But we all know what happens after the Universe 6 tournament. Being such an interesting matchup and kind of a big tournament, Zeno wasn't the only one to witness it, and of course some of the other gods saw it as well on GodTube. Specifically, Akai named Zamasu from Universe 10. The power that these mortals are showing off. It kind of angers him. We now skip ahead to the future Trunks timeline. Even though the events of the Cell Saga were different, nothing really changes too much in Trunks' timeline. It goes pretty standard. The only thing being that Trunks was a little stronger, but not really by much. And this is a bad thing for him, since the timeline didn't change at all. Because he still gets an unexpected visitor. This visitor looks like someone from Trunks' past. Someone who he thought he'd never see in his timeline again. This villain, it's not Goku Black. It's something that hits much closer to home for Trunks. It's Vegeta Black. Trunks is barely able to escape the assault that he's facing right now, and climbs into a time machine as it flies off and he sends him back to the past. Vegeta Black watches, a little bit disappointed that he didn't get to kill Trunks, but he'll be able to catch up to Trunks eventually. 
Trunks arrives back in the past. With Bulma finding him and calling Goku, Vegeta, and Gohan over, Trunks eventually regains his consciousness, and the first thing he sees is Goku and then Vegeta next to him. Still under a lot of stress, he instantly becomes hostile towards Vegeta, with him instantly attacking Vegeta, even though Vegeta is able to block it very quickly. Vegeta doesn't know what's gotten into Trunks, but he has to calm him down. Trunks eventually comes to his senses and realizes that he's in the past, and he apologizes for attacking Vegeta, but he does need to explain himself. He explains what happened in his timeline, and how there's a Vegeta clone there, or it might even be Vegeta but he's evil? He doesn't know who it is. This is weird for everyone to hear, obviously. Vegeta's supposed to be dead in the future, so it doesn't really make sense that there's one over there too. But according to Trunks' description, it doesn't seem like it's actually Vegeta, which is the most interesting part. While Trunks is catching everyone up to speed about what happened in his timeline so far, and who he thinks Vegeta Black might be, their conversation is suddenly interrupted. Not too far from Capsule Corp, above in the sky, a blackish purple portal opens in the air all of a sudden. Emerging from the portal is none other than Vegeta Black. So, why Vegeta Black and not Goku Black? Well, the explanation is pretty simple. Like I mentioned in the last part, Vegeta is the strongest right now in this scenario, and Zamasu saw that power on full display during the Universe 6 tournament. Especially after that whole thing with Super Saiyan Blue Kyle Ken, he realized that Vegeta is a good pick for a body steal. Because he doesn't really have any reason to take Goku's body this time, and instead just goes for Vegeta. Ultimately, this leads to Vegeta Black being a thing in this scenario. Immediately when he sees this doppelganger, Vegeta is pretty pissed off. Right away, he goes to fight this clone. In one of my other what ifs, I had it so that Vegeta killed Vegeta Black as soon as he showed up. And while Vegeta does have that same goal here, things are going to go a little bit different. Going into blue right away, Vegeta lunges towards Vegeta Black. When sensing this guy's power, Vegeta Black realizes that he can't stay here much longer. Well, he should at least make his trip worthwhile, and he notices Trunks' time machine nearby, so he blows that up, all while trying to desperately avoid Vegeta's attacks. He does get hit a couple of times, and when Vegeta's about to deliver the finishing blow, Black activates his time ring and then heads back to his timeline, being pretty beat up already. This gets the group to realize that this guy might be pretty strong, but if Goku or Vegeta, maybe even Gohan were to use their full power in this scenario, they'd be more than enough to take him out. Little do they know though, he's going to get a big boost in power from that fight with Vegeta. In the meantime though, everything in the present timeline stays pretty much the same. During the time it takes to finish the time machine, all that same stuff happens. Back in the future timeline though, Vegeta Black arrives back in pretty bad shape, but Zamasu's able to heal him so it's not really that big of a deal. This actually turns out really good for Black, because much like Goku Black, this means he gets a Zenkai and eventually unlocks Super Saiyan Rose. This will definitely be a huge help once everyone comes back to this timeline. After some time passes, the time machine is fixed, and Trunks heads back to his timeline with Vegeta and Gohan this time. Because of all the events on Namek and the whole reason the scenario started in the first place, Gohan is a lot more proactive, so he actually is present in this arc. And like normal, Goku stays back. Because in terms of Vegeta Black, Whis and Beerus actually have a hunch as to who the true identity of this guy is. So Goku sticks with them, and they all head to Universe 10 to visit Zamasu. While that's happening, Trunks, Vegeta, and Gohan enter the time machine once again. The three of them arrive in this timeline, and after meeting up with Mai and all the people living underground, they come back up to the surface and are faced once again with Vegeta Black. Except this time, things are a little different. There's someone else with Vegeta Black, who introduces himself as Zamasu and he looks kind of like a Kai. This guy could probably be the key to who Vegeta Black truly is, and of course, he is the key, because he explains all the info everyone needed. Who he is, who Vegeta Black is, and why they're here, and what they plan to do. Zamasu lays out the Zero Mortals plan like usual. The three of them don't care though. They go to attack Vegeta Black, who then begins to show off a new power of his. He transforms and shows off his new form, Super Saiyan Rose, which actually is powerful enough to even match Vegeta in power. While Vegeta fights his clone, Gohan and Trunks try to fight Zamasu. In terms of power, Zamasu is not too much trouble to fight, but they soon come to see what his immortality truly entails, and how they can't actually counter it. Whatever attacks they land on Zamasu, they don't do anything. Gohan and Trunks at one point even think they killed Zamasu, but he just regenerates. There seems to be no actual way to kill him. Vegeta continues fighting Vegeta Black, the latter of which actually has an advantage in this battle. Vegeta is getting beaten pretty badly, and they realize that they need to retreat. Trunks decides to create a diversion using a solar flare. 
Gohan uses his instant transmission to retrieve Vegeta as quick as possible, so the three of them can head back to the time machine ASAP while the blindness wears off for Zamasu and Vegeta Black. They were able to get there in time and actually escape. Back in the present timeline, things went pretty normal when meeting Zamasu. They learn of Zamasu's involvement in the future, and with Beerus and Whis spying on Zamasu in this timeline, they end up finding out that he's actually a bad guy, since they see him trying to kill Goasu, and like normal, he gets erased. Trunks is about to head back, but then Gohan brings something up that's really important. Thinking ahead, he brings up the fact that the timelines are different, so pretty much like the Android Saga, killing one person here might not mean it's going to affect the future. I mean, while Zamasu was traveling through time, who's to say that the one from the future timeline is actually not a different Zamasu? Killing him here doesn't 100% guarantee that he won't be present in the future still. That's a good point, because even though he does have the time ring, this still could be a possibility, and it could be two separate Zamasus. So before they head back, they actually want to head back prepared. During the few days, Gohan actually doesn't end up training and goes back to his job because he can't really be gone for too long. But Vegeta does end up training like normal. But while that's going on, Goku decides to take Trunks to Kame House, where they can learn the evil containment wave. This should be pretty useful. Since Zamasu's immortal, they don't really have any way to kill him. So instead, they decide to contain him. Sealing him like this would be a good way to defeat him. This training does go pretty well for them. Vegeta has gotten even stronger since his fight with Vegeta Black and Super Saiyan Rose, and the training that he did in the meantime actually helped him grow stronger. And on top of that, Goku and Trunks actually learn this new technique, and unlike Goku did before, they don't actually forget the seal this time. So with the capsule and the seal, they head back to the future, with Vegeta coming along too, as well as Gohan, who didn't really do much during this time. But no matter though, it's only been a few days. They arrive back, and immediately, they encounter Zamasu and Vegeta Black once again. They have a different strategy this time. Goku and Vegeta are going to try to take on Vegeta Black as a distraction, while Gohan and Trunks can try to handle Zamasu once again. And when Zamasu least expects it, Trunks can break out the evil containment wave and actually seal him for good. This plan begins to work, as Goku and Vegeta can separate Black from Zamasu. While they fight him, Trunks and Gohan are able to hold off Zamasu for a bit. Gohan places the container down, and gives Trunks the thumbs up. Zamasu turns around and sees Trunks perform some sort of technique, and then gets caught up in some wave of energy from Trunks. No matter how hard he tries, he can't escape. Vegeta Black notices this and tries to head over to help him, but Goku and Vegeta stop him, as well as Gohan being there to help. After Zamasu is lifted up into the air, Trunks brings his hands down which puts Zamasu in the container. Quickly, they put the cap on and then seal it, with Trunks stashing the container in his pocket, and they have finally captured Zamasu. They're actually pretty surprised that the plan worked, but glad nonetheless. However, they still have Vegeta Black to deal with. Vegeta Black is pretty strong here. After his fight with Vegeta last time, he got another small Zenkai, but not as big as the first one. He was actually able to give Goku and Vegeta some trouble during their fight. And now, Vegeta Black is pissed off. Without Zamasu, how can the Zero Mortals plan proceed? Angered, he launches himself towards Trunks, trying to get that capsule from him. Trunks wouldn't be enough to even take on Vegeta Black here, so he focuses on avoiding him and tries to make an escape in order to protect the container with Zamasu inside. While Trunks tries to escape, Vegeta, Goku, and Gohan will take on Vegeta Black and actually try to kill him this time, in order to finally save the future for good. With the help of everyone else, Trunks is able to escape after a diversion is created, and now it's just Vegeta Black versus Goku, Vegeta, and Gohan. He's very angry though, and does begin fighting more aggressively, utilizing his anger to power him up further. Much like Goku Black, he even creates his sickle and brings out all the clones of himself which he didn't even know he could really do. But he's not going to question it. If it can help him fight these guys, he doesn't really care. He uses every technique at his disposal, as well as the other three using theirs. With Goku and Vegeta both in blue Kaioken, and Gohan using ultimate, they're able to gain an upper hand against Vegeta Black. Not only because it's a 3 on 1, but in terms of their collective power, they overpower him. But they gotta make this fight short, and try to end it as quick as possible. Remembering how well Trunks' solar flare worked last time, Goku decides to break out his own solar flare and use it against Vegeta Black, which temporarily stuns him. Vegeta Black is quite literally swinging blindly, trying to attack everyone but to no avail while his vision tries to recover. He's kicked in the back which launches him diagonally towards the ground, and as he tries to get up and recover his vision, through the blurriness, he's able to see something in front of him, a beam of light that's beginning to grow. Together, Goku, Gohan, and Vegeta are charging attacks, two Kamehamehas and a final flash. And before he could even fully recover, the three beams are launched towards him. All three energy blasts combine and swirl together towards Vegeta Black. He tries to counter at the last second, but it's too late. 
His beam gets swallowed by the three beams combined. And eventually, the beam swallows him as well, and then careens off into space, leaving a massive crater in its wake. The three power back down, and then Trunks comes out of hiding. They did it. They beat both Zamasu and Vegeta Black, and they actually saved this timeline this time. No need to erase it. With one last trip, Trunks takes them back to the past, to which Beerus gives a sigh of relief once he hears that it's over. Trunks thanks everyone for their help, and appreciates them trying to save his timeline. Now, hopefully, that'll be the last time he'll need to use the time machine, and hopefully the future is actually at peace for good this time. And with that out of the way, we now move on to the Universe Survival Saga. Things go pretty much the same in the events that lead up to it, except in the Zen Exhibition match, Boo is actually replaced by Tien. Like in the Universe 6 tournament, Tien's around more often and is willing to help out, so he joins the tournament without any convincing, really. But the team is going to be a little different this time around. If you remember from a few parts ago, Krillin never had his interaction with Android 18, so the two androids aren't around at all. So they need to improvise when coming up with team members. Because of Tien being there, Yamcha's actually one of the first options, because if you remember, he got a lot of training in the Cell and Boo saga which made him really strong, so he's going to be a useful member to have on the team. They're having a tough time thinking of two other fighters to put in the team. They do consider Android 16, who is still alive here, but he needs some serious upgrades before going into the tournament, and they don't have any time to do that. This actually gets them to think. What if they ask the other two androids? 16's mechanical body hasn't really improved over time because it's mechanical and it would need actual repairs and upgrades. But Android 17 and 18, they're actually not mechanical like 16. So maybe they've improved in terms of strength and maybe they'll help out. I mean, it might sound crazy to recruit a former villain, but when you consider that they recruited Frieza in the original scenario with no trouble, it's not really that out there. But other than the two androids, they do have another option. Although they might not be as disciplined and a little bit less experienced, they have two other powerful options, that being Goten and Trunks. The only reason Goku and Gohan are actually hesitant to bring them on board is really due to how they act in battle. They're not really that disciplined like I mentioned, but maybe if they trained with Piccolo for a bit, he could whip them in the shape so they'll be ready for the fight. But I'm actually going to leave this up to a poll so you guys can decide who gets recruited on the team. So last time I left off with a poll saying if Android 17 and 18 would be on the team or if Goten and Trunks would be on and a large majority of you voted for Goten and Trunks to be on the team. See, the androids are alive and everyone did consider recruiting them, but they're not really too keen on the idea. They don't know the androids like they do in the normal timeline. They may be good or at least neutral by now, but no one knows for sure and they don't really want to recruit them anyways. They feel Goten and Trunks are a good pick. And since Piccolo doesn't really need to spend time training Gohan, since Gohan doesn't need to be caught up, he could spend time actually training Goten and Trunks and get them a little more disciplined. And I will say here now, Goten and Trunks actually do have Super Saiyan 2. I never really understood why they didn't get it in canon, especially considering how easily they got Super Saiyan. But I guess it's just the result of them being pushed to the side and forgotten. But they won't be forgotten in this what if. They're going to be important here. And since Gohan has been training a little bit more in this timeline, of course he's going to be training with his brother occasionally. Same with Trunks. So in those times that Gohan does train, sometimes Goten joined, and he actually did get a little bit stronger. He hasn't really kept up with his training too much, but it's enough for him to actually unlock Super Saiyan 2 at this point, same with Trunks. And even if they've been slacking off a bit, Piccolo has some time to whip them into shape before the tournament, and he does just that. And with that pre-tournament stuff done, we can get into the actual tournament itself. And well, Universe 7 has a pretty good shot this time. Not that they didn't in canon, but here, they got some good chances. Seven of the team members are the same, except 17, 18, and Frieza are replaced with Goten, Trunks, and Yamcha. Sure, they did lose Frieza and 17 who were really strong fighters, but consider what they gained here. Tien, Krillin, and Yamcha are all way stronger in this scenario, since they've done a lot more training and they have access to Kaioken. Plus, Vegeta and Gohan are noticeably stronger too, so overall, the odds are kinda in their favor. And now, the fighting itself begins. One thing that I want to start off by saying is that the Universe 6 Saiyans don't actually have Super Saiyan this time around. Because if you remember back a few parts ago, Gohan was the one to face Kaba in the Universe 6 vs 7 tournament. And that resulted in Kaba not learning how to go Super Saiyan. And by extension, that means Caulifla and Kale don't have it either. Plus, Kaba doesn't really have his bond with Vegeta like before, because he never really had any interaction with him. So Vegeta actually won't be there to help him out a bit this time. Universe 6 is going to have a tough time here. One of the first changes that I'll say happens in the tournament is that Frost isn't actually able to knock out Krillin. Krillin has a much easier time facing who he's up against, even if he's not with 18 here, because he has Kaioken now and is stronger in general. He still does receive a sneak attack from Frost, but doesn't do anything. Interestingly enough, 
Gohan and the scenario got into transmission a while back, and he decides to use it to its full potential. See, that's another thing, I wonder why Goku didn't use it as much in the tournament. Anyways, Gohan's quick to pick up on Krillin being knocked out, and just as he goes over the edge, Gohan teleports over to him, and then teleports Krillin and himself back to where Piccolo is. Since no one could fly, this technique is really handy here in the tournament, as both Goku and Gohan realize how stupidly overpowered it would be to use. Gohan then teleports back to Frost and finishes the job. So there goes one of Universe 6's strongest fighters. Following this, not too much of interest happens. Roshi actually gets to stay in longer since he doesn't have to deal with Frost, and as for Caulifla and Kale, well, they don't really stand a much of a chance without Super Saiyan. Sure, they're strong enough without it, but having it is a huge help. Especially for Kale, who wasn't really that into fighting before. Sadly for them, this means that Caulifla gets knocked out, with Kale not far behind. Following this, we have the same Spirit Bomb deal with Jiren and Goku. And this actually results in pretty much the same deal. Jiren pushes the Spirit Bomb back, Goku falls in, he unlocks Ultra Instinct Omen, and faces off with Jiren briefly. But it doesn't result in much in the end. Out of energy, Vegeta lends some to Goku, and then goes off to face Jiren on his own, wanting to maintain his advantage over Goku in terms of power. This Ultra Instinct thing that he just got gave him a huge boost above Vegeta, and Vegeta wonders if he can accomplish the same thing. Fighters are getting picked off left and right, mainly from other universes, but eventually Universe 7 sees their first losses. Roshi stayed in a little bit longer, but he does still proceed to get knocked out later on. He can't keep up as well as the other humans and other fighters on his team. And even though Gohan was able to bail out Krillin once, that was just luck on Krillin's part since Gohan was close enough to see and sense what was happening. But besides Roshi, he's one of the weaker members on the team even with Kyle Ken, since Yamcha and Tien were much more consistent with their training in this scenario as well as having higher levels of Kaioken, and having practiced it more. This results in Krillin eventually getting knocked off too. Speaking of Yamcha and Tien, they stick really close to each other for the tournament, since they have great synergy in terms of fighting. If you remember back a few parts ago, even in the Cell and Buu sagas, they were training together non-stop, and had some really great gains in power. Add Kaioken on top of that, and they're a pretty deadly force. Sticking together makes it a lot safer and easier for them to take on enemies. And even though they do have Kaioken, it's not like they could just spam it because of how draining it is on their energy, so they do try to use it as efficiently as possible. And this strategy that they have actually works out pretty well. They survive a lot longer than what you'd expect for Tien and Yamcha, especially with all the different techniques each of them can use. As for Universe 6, well, like I said, it's not really going too well for them. They already lost a lot of their strong fighters, and the only ones they have remaining are Hit, Kaba, the Namekians, and Dr. Rota. Dr. Rota being the strongest in the tournament right now. Jokes aside, this isn't really that good of a scenario for them. Hit is a lot more careful, but he does try to face Jiren on his own, and that results in him getting knocked out. And without him, Universe 6 is pretty much doomed. Okay, I was joking about Dr. Rota, he wouldn't even be around at this point, but Kaba would still be around, since even without Super Saiyan, he is a decent fighter, but that's only gonna go so far. In his last stand, through sheer determination and willpower, with the hope of his whole universe resting on his shoulders, Kaba breaks past his limits and unlocks something that he didn't even know was possible. He turns Super Saiyan for the first time. He saw this form before from the people from Universe 7, but he didn't know it was possible for him to do it too, especially at his level. Sadly though, it's not really enough for him. It's kind of tragic when you think about it. In the last moments of his universe, he's able to get this new power, thinking maybe it'll help him, and temporarily it does but it doesn't go too far in terms of the tournament overall. This leads to Universe 6's early elimination, after the Namekians are taken out by Gohan and Piccolo. Universe 2 is also eliminated around the same time, and then when up against Universe 4's stealth fighters, Tien and Yamcha do get taken out too, but then that results in Universe 4 getting eliminated. Following this, Aniraza appears like normal, and he gets eliminated pretty easily. They don't have Seventeen who jumps into the beam and punches him right in the head, but the power of everyone combined should be enough to actually take him out. Speaking of that, I haven't really covered Goten and Trunks too much yet, and that's mainly because they've been very careful about their moves. Piccolo whipped them into shape and got them a lot more disciplined, and for the most part they're either sticking with Piccolo or with Gohan, who are watching them to make sure they don't mess up. In case they need to be bailed out, Gohan or Piccolo will be right there to help. And this strategy is actually pretty good and works out, because Dispo then tries to attack Goten and Trunks, which would be really bad for them since they wouldn't be able to take him on by themselves. However, Gohan and Piccolo are there to assist them, and with Gohan's power boost in this scenario, he alone would be enough to take out Dispo. So add Piccolo and a stronger Goten and Trunks into the equation, 
and it's not really a contest. Dispo still does get eliminated. Universe 7 has a lot of fighters left compared to Universe 11, who now only has Jiren and Topo, with every other universe being eliminated at this point. Jiren's pretty much solo, as Goku and Vegeta are facing him, and Piccolo, Gohan, and even Goten and Trunks try to face up against Topo. Again, I'd even assume that Gohan here alone would be enough to take on Topo. It wouldn't really be too much of a stretch here to say that, considering how much more training he's gotten. And Vegeta was able to do it alone even when he transformed into his God of Destruction mode, which Topo doesn't do here because he's not provoked by Frieza. Goten and Trunks are pretty much there to watch and learn, but they do help out and assist. They really just need to stick close by because if they end up getting knocked out somehow, then Gohan's gonna be there to save them with instant transmission. Topo does consider abandoning his values and becoming his God of Destruction mode, but he decides against it, which ultimately leads to him being defeated. So now, it's pretty much the remaining fighters Universe 7 versus Jiren, and they may have strength in numbers, but Jiren has more strength than them all collectively at this point. Goten and Trunks can't even fuse to help because they never learned fusion in the scenario, and even if they did, it wouldn't be too much of a help. But they're still motivated and want to help out anyways, as are everyone else on the team. Vegeta asks Goku if he could do that Ultra Instinct thing again, but he can't do it at will. He doesn't know how he unlocked it, or how Vegeta could do it himself. And it would be crazy to do anything to risk Vegeta's life in order to try and unlock it, because Vegeta's still the strongest team member, and they can't afford to lose him. I mean, even if he weren't the strongest, that would be kind of stupid to do, even though Vegeta does consider doing it. They don't really know anything else to do in terms of power, but technique could be very helpful here. They're all able to come up with a plan. Since the way to win is just having to push them off the ring, why don't they just do that? I mean, they've already tried breaking the ground beneath him, but Jiren's smarter than that. They'll need to think outside the box. And Gohan does just that. The same technique that he's been using to try and help people on his team, it's in transmission, can be used to defeat Jiren, although it would require sacrifice. The plan is to have someone jump off the ring, as far off as they can into the air, just high enough so that they don't get eliminated right away and have some time while they're falling. While that person is in the air, Goku or Gohan can teleport Jiren over to them, as they all fall into the void. It is risky because if it doesn't work, then they'll be down by two fighters. But the risk seems kind of worth it, and Jiren doesn't know about this plan, unlike the groundbreaking thing. He hasn't seen Goku use into transmission, so he won't really expect this to happen. Plus, even if he did see Goku use it, he doesn't know that Gohan has this technique either. With Goku, Vegeta, Gohan, Goten, and Trunks all creating a distraction, Piccolo sprints towards the edge of the ring, leaping high in the air as he goes off the edge. Jiren doesn't even notice this because he has five other people he's focusing on in front of him, which is good because he took the bait. Piccolo yells out to Gohan, who then places a hand on Jiren when he doesn't expect it. Placing his fingers on his forehead, he teleports both him and Jiren towards Piccolo, who's currently falling out of the ring right now. To ensure they fall, Piccolo and Gohan both grab onto Jiren and tackle him, trying to pivot him towards the void. Jiren is eventually able to break free from their grasp, and he's about to fire a blast to launch him back into the ring, but it's too late. Before he can even fire it off, he, Gohan, and Piccolo all fall into the void and are eliminated. Goku never gets to go into Ultra Instinct again, Vegeta doesn't get his blue evolution form, and Universe 7 has four fighters left this time instead of one. In terms of the MVP, Goku's pretty much a clear choice here. Goten and Trunks did decently well during the first half, but once things started ramping up, but once it came down to the wire and there was only strong fighters left like Topo, Jiren, and Dispo, they couldn't really do much to help, but they were there to motivate everyone, and still never gave up. But they wouldn't really be considered to be the MVPs. Vegeta also could be considered, but in a situation like this I feel like Goku would get the nomination. But it doesn't matter too much either way because the universes are still revived from the wish. Just as Zeno foresaw and wanted to happen. And with that, the Tournament of Power is concluded and Universe 7 is victorious, returning back to their home. Well, what now? So naturally following this would be the Broly movie, but Frieza's not alive, so he's not going to be recruiting anyone, meaning Broly and Paragus will probably remain on Planet Vampa for the time being, if they even get discovered at all. Maybe the Frieza Force would be out scouting planets, but considering it's been basically disbanded and Frieza's not back, I'm pretty doubtful about it happening. I'm gonna call this a temporary finale for now. I'll wait and see how the Moor arc plans out before I continue this one, because with how the Moor arc is going now, I'm not really sure it'll go too different even with the event in this scenario, so I want to wait for it to play out entirely before I cover that. There's some differences here and there, but overall, right now, I don't see too much being different. We'll have to wait and see. And that's where we'll end this part and this what if for now. So what did you guys think about this part and what if as a whole? And if continued, what do you think will happen next? 
Leave your thoughts and suggestions in the comments below, and I'll be sure to check them out. As always, if you liked the video, be sure to drop a like, and if you haven't already, why not subscribe? As well as hitting the bell icon to get notified about any future videos I post on my channel, including future parts of this what if, or other videos like it. Thank you all for watching, and I'll see you on my next video.